Hello, my name is Justin Paperni. I was told to surrender around 10 o'clock in the morning. Nice to know you. Oh, excuse me. You, you don't shake hands with, with inmates. And there you have it. I was in jail for about nine seconds and I did something I wasn't supposed to do. So many prisoners do it. So let's talk about Elizabeth Holmes. She's getting ready to go in for more than 11 years. Certainly there are some things she should do and there are some things she should not do. In our series, we've covered life in federal prison, first day in federal prison, jobs in federal prison. I covered what Elizabeth Holmes could do to get a shorter federal prison sentence. Uh, she elected to throw that information in the absolute toilet. In this video, our final video, unless something crazy happens, like she wins the appeal, which I, I know would all of you'd go apoplectic, okay? You don't want her back in the rented mansion with the young family and the fiance. So this is the final video, unless something major happens. And we've been on a journey together. I'm incredibly grateful for all of you continuing to return to the White Collar Advice channel, and I'm going to strive to provide value. Now, with do's and don'ts, okay, there's, this is, there's only so many I can get into. Okay, so this is not an exactly an exhaustive list. So I got to keep it brief in part because some of y'all send messages that are like, hey, man, wrap it up. You talk too much. You ramble. Get to the point. So for that reason, I'm going to cover some of the major ones with hopes that it helps you better understand what her life will be like on the wrong side of prison boundaries at Bryan Federal Prison Camp for 11 years. Can you believe Sonny Balwani got 13? Should he have gotten more? I don't know. You can't respond. I'm asking myself this question. So let's jump in with some, something she should not do besides the obvious of not doing dumb things like me and trying to shake hands with the correctional officer. One thing she should not do is she should not be an informant. Now, I know some of you are thinking, Justin, she went to trial. She doesn't think she did anything wrong. She didn't cooperate against Balwani, which had she cooperated against Balwani, I think, and pled guilty, she probably gets three or four years. So why would suddenly she be an informant now? I have the answer to that question because I've been in this game for a long time. Our team has. She didn't think she was going to be convicted. And even after conviction, she didn't think she was going to get 11 years. And guess what happens when you hear 11 years? Wow, that's a long time. So suddenly you, it's kind of like a values play. What's of higher value trying to get home? So there are people in federal prison who are given the opportunity to inform against other prisoners. So there are people walking around that compound looking for criminal activity, looking for people that have iPhones. We're going to get into that next. Don't worry. They're looking for criminal activity with hopes they can refer to the case manager who can then refer to the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney. And boom, someone gets resentenced. When I was in federal prison, there were guys. I saw them at the compound the day before, work with them in the kitchen, and the next day they're gone. They're like, what happened? They had six years left on their sentence. They did something. So do not think for a moment that if given an opportunity, someone, even someone who went to trial, would not cooperate. Part of the reason she may cooperate, if given the opportunity, she doesn't think she did anything wrong. It was very easy for me. I want to say easy. I'm just like a crazier. It was easier for me to go to federal prison. Can I tell you why? I did it, right? So standing for count, separation from my family, working that prison job, some of the injustices or indignities, I should say, that follow serving time in prison was easier for me because my dumbass did it. In her case, she don't think she belongs there. So for that reason, she may want to try to pursue a path to get out as quickly as possible. Another thing or second thing Elizabeth Holmes should not do, contraband. Now, a lot of people say to our team before they go to prison, look, man, uh, I'm not going to use an iPhone. You're crazy. We don't need to waste time on disciplinary infractions. I'll never use one. And here's my response. Well, let's, let's do some role play here. Let's pretend it's 2015 and I'm having a conversation with Elizabeth Holmes. Where's my phone? I can't find it. The kids are watching a Paw Patrol in the other room. Elizabeth, uh, in seven years, you're going to self-surrender to the federal prison camp in Bryan, Texas. What do you think? Is that a possibility? No chance. It's not going to happen. You were just with Jim Cramer on Mad Money. It's no chance it's ever going to happen. Got it. Thank you. So that's what the lion's share of people who traverse this criminal justice system say. It ain't never going to happen to me. I ain't going to prison. Those are the same people who say, Justin, I'm not going to get into trouble, man. Those are then the same people who call me or the wives call me a month later. Joe got caught with the iPhone. He's in the hole. What happens next? So I would encourage Elizabeth Holmes to avoid the iPhone, the contraband, as best she possibly can. But there are temptations, right? It will be very easy because there will be hundreds of iPhones within that prison. At Bryan Federal Prison Camp or any prison camp, figure for every hundred prisoners, there's one correctional officer. Essentially, it's the wild, wild west there. So when she gets there, I would encourage her to be careful about the friendship she forms because she could form a friendship with someone who engages in the prison hustle, has an iPhone, gets into trouble. She may feel vulnerable at one time. She wants to FaceTime the young kids and fiance and just like that, boom, thanks for calling. Have a nice day. It could be a new charge. Go to the hole, lose good time, transfer to a higher security prison. Bad things happen. Another thing, in my humble opinion, she shouldn't do is gamble. 
to avoid gambling, she's really going to have to create a proactive prison routine that keeps her out of the, the TV room, like some women will rule like their fiefdom, I know from a I know from experience. So she's going to have to create a routine that is productive and proactive where she avoids the gambling, the dominoes, betting on football and in and, and games like women in these federal prisons do. With gambling comes major issues, including disciplinary infractions. Number four, and I want you to know everything I'm covering on this do and do not do list has happened since I've been working in this space in, uh, since 2009. Sexual misconduct. Yeah, it's happened. Uh, I frequently say that just because someone in our someone hires our team doesn't mean they're going to follow the advice. Just like someone may hire a fitness coach, those they may sit on the couch eating donuts. There have been people in our community who have had interactions, sexual interactions with guards, both male and female. And I was inside for 388 days away from the fair sex. And I will tell you, it was hard. She's got 11 years. And all I can convey to her and to all of you is it happens with staff, with other prisoners. I would encourage her to avoid any sexual misconduct on the inside. Are you with me? Let's keep going. Something she should not do is talking to the guards. Now look, if they open the door for you, you say thank you and vice versa. But too many prisoners stand in the front of the dorm like talking to the staff. Oh, how are you? Oh, you saw me in Jim Cramer. That was a great interview. It was, I wasn't expecting it to go as it did. I thought that it went well, but I'm so, you watch the Hulu show as well. Uh, working on a book deal is fantastic. Thank you. Again, because Elizabeth Holmes might better identify with staff. In other words, the law abiding citizens. It might be easier for her to communicate with her. The problemo is if she's speaking with staff and then like 45 minutes later, later some woman's locker is being searched. You know what that prisoner may deduce? Wasn't Elizabeth Holmes, that celebrity, speaking to that guard a little while ago and how ironic my locker is being searched? That's when you begin to get ostracized and is articulated in the shameless plug for my book, Lessons from Prison, you can get for free at whitecolloradvice.com. In chapter 20, Ron, I wrote about a prisoner who ran to staff and about three days later, he went to his bunk to see feces and urine. It was sickening. I was glad I was on my, I was glad I was on my way home. So I would encourage her to, to avoid staff and also not follow suit with prisoners that mock staff. And there are times prisoners mock staff, like if the guard struggles with standing count, right? In federal prison, we are counted many times a day. And sometimes the guards struggle to count the prisoners correctly. Therefore, they have to do it again. Some prisoners don't like standing for too long. And they'll be like, can't, can't you people count? Sometimes they need to do it again. If they hear that, and if the guard feels threatened or embarrassed or called out, they're going to call out everyone in that area, potentially send them to the hole. Bad things happen. So I would encourage her uh, to, to stay quiet. I would also encourage Elizabeth Holmes to not engage in the prison hustle or not engage in the hustle, at least till she fully understands this environment. There are a lot of people who surrender to prison and they try to manipulate this environment of correction before they understand it. The problem is after they're there for like three months, six months, nine months, they think they own it. They think they, they understand it. Then they begin to manipulate it. That could include the iPhone, having money go to other prisoners' books paying people to do your job. She will be given an opportunity to, to not do her job, whether it's scrubbing toilets or showers, working in, in the kitchen or as an orderly or gardening. She so People will come to her and say, hey, for two books of stamps, I will do your job. Please do your job. It shows you're willing to contribute to this uh, community. And I can tell you, staff really doesn't care if you don't do your job. As a guard told someone in federal prison when I was there, hey man, I don't care if you clean the bathroom because uh, I don't use the bathroom. I don't care, but staff is watching. So I encourage her to do her job and recognize the consequences of engaging in uh, the prison hustle. Significant consequences, myriad people get caught. It's usually after they let, uh, it's kind of after they let their guard down. Now, let's not forget that phone calls on the inside are recorded just like emails can be read. So what she should not do is the following. My kids are still watching Paw Patrol. I'm gonna do a phone call now. Well, let's pretend she's with a case manager. Miss case manager, this, this programming here at Bryan is just phenomenal. In fact, if the programming was at this level when I was at Stanford, I don't think I would have dropped out of Stanford. I'm not joking. It's this good, the programming inside of this federal prison. Fantastic. Thank you. You're awesome. Any other programming, I can enroll in. So she will give praise, or she should, to the case manager for thanking her for enrolling in the programming. Then, then what happens sometimes next? They get on the phone. Yeah. Yeah, how to talk with the case matter. Programming, it's a, it's a joke. No bueno, I'm doing it only to get the earned time credits. Thankfully, President Trump signed that in 2018. By the way, any chance he gets uh, reelected? Does he like to pardon celebrities? Can you look into that? We need to find a way to contribute to that campaign because if he gets elected, word on the street is he could pardon me. What do you think? No, he won't pardon me. All I know is this programming sucks. It's awful, but hey, I gotta do what I gotta do to get the time off. Okay, phone calls are recorded. <laughs> Never forget that. There have been people who have been thrown out of the drug program 
where you can get a year off your sentence because they tell staff one thing and then they say something fundamentally different via email or on the phone. You have got to be totally consistent. Now, another thing that some prisoners do, they forget that this is an environment where some women have lived for weeks, months, years, and decades. So once she gets there, she should not try to like assert her authority. She should follow the rules we teach our kids in kindergarten. I taught them to my children on a scale of one to 10, it was about a five. But in federal prison, what it cannot be is a three because problems follow. You don't cut in line. You don't complain. You don't blame other people. You don't complain about the length of your sentence. You want to know why? Because our country is drunk on incarcerating people. And I can assure you there are females inside of that federal prison who were there because of our war on drugs and who have been in and out of the system their whole life and did not have the opportunities that people like Elizabeth Holmes and yours truly squandered. When you complain, when you cut in line, when you yell on the phone, when you use potentially the wrong shower, when you don't invest the time to understand the pitfalls and some of the unwritten rules of imprisonment, bad things can follow. Because while it's generally a nonviolent environment, if you act like a fool in Dunkin' Donuts, you may get beat up. If you act like a fool in federal prison, bad things follow. Yet in our experience here, White Collar Advice, too many prisoners don't really understand the consequences that can follow one word or one statement, which leads to another thing she should not do. And to help, I'm going to rely, discuss my business partner, Michael Santos' book, Earning Freedom. He served 26 years in federal prison. I met him while I was there. After I was in prison for about two weeks, Michael and I were forming a friendship. And I uh, said to him, hey, man, why do you wake like at three o'clock in the morning? You ever consider like sleeping in? Sleep in a little bit. Relax, man. It's fine. You've been inside for a long time. You'll be home soon. He said, would you take a walk with me? I said, where are we going? He said, just take a walk with me. I said, great. So we walked to the library and he pulled out this wonderful book I eventually read called uh, Atlas Shrugged by Anne Rand. And there he went to page 1,182 and he asked me to read this quote that said, it is not advisable to venture unsolicited opinions. You should spare yourself the embarrassing discovery of their exact value to your listener. In other words, when you're a new prisoner, do not offer unsolicited advice. Elizabeth Holmes, do not offer unsolicited advice, please, unless you want things to go rogue uh, and go badly. Another thing she should not do is make assumptions about prisoners. Yours truly, I was guilty of that. If you asked me before I went to federal prison, you know, before I ever got into to trouble, if you'd asked me what I thought about federal prison, you know, I would have said, those people are bad, man. They deserve to be in prison. They're born bad. They're just they're inveterate criminals. I don't want them in my community. I don't want them near me. Those are some bad people. Then I got to federal prison. And I'm like, wow, there's a lot of smart people here. Many of these people shouldn't be in prison. There's myriad mental health issues that should be treated outside of prison. And many of them have not had the opportunities that, that I wasted. I'm learning from them. They never complain. They're working and preparing to come home. They've been in jail for nine years, yet they do their job. In fact, they do the jobs of seven people because they can make more money. Like, wow, these are some good dudes. I'm learning from them. She should not presume anything about the women with whom she will be serving time, despite some of them having 70, 80, 90% of their bodies tattooed. I will tell you, I've never seen tattoos. Well, I have at Disneyland. But other than some of the tattoos I've seen at Disneyland where in the summer people are next to naked, you're gonna, she's going to see some tattoos in there that'll put you into next week, okay? But that doesn't mean they're bad. They're great people and many of whom I learned from. She should not make assumptions about another federal prisoner. Continuing, borrowing medications. A number of prisoners will struggle from insomnia. They're tired. They're injured, right? A lot of people go to prison. They're out of shape. They start running long distance marathons like yours truly. And then you get hurt and they give you ibuprofen and they're not going to treat you. But there are prisoners who are prescribed some of these medications. You go to pill call, put it in your mouth, you know, swallow, you take it upstairs, you trade for it, i.e. the prison hustle. If she were to ever take a medication to sleep or to do something bad, there are drugs there and she gets caught. Why? Because there are informants. If she's not informing, others will be looking to inform against her. And she takes a drug test the next day, drug test the next day. It's game over. Thanks for calling. Have a nice week. So she has to be very careful about borrowing medications. It's one thing to borrow granola and a Diet Coke and say, hey, I'll get you in the next commissary shopping. What you do not do is borrow medications. Another thing, missing count or getting late to count. You can be written up. She needs to check the call out sheet every single day. Continuing on, if she chooses to watch TV, which is a horrific and, and bad idea because I don't understand how watching TV is going to put her in a position to prepare to pay the 900 million, however much she owes. I don't know how that's going to help her rebuild her brand and reputation by watching the Kardashians, which is apparently very popular on the inside. I don't think that's in her interest. But if she is ever watching TV, she should not do what I did, which was a I changed the channel from basketball to golf. I thought I was going to get jumped. 
Okay, I literally thought about nine dudes were going to jump on me, thankfully, because I had adjusted well and I didn't complain and I did my job. They were like, hey, we're going to kind of give you a, like a little freebie here. Don't ever effing change the channel again. I'm like, I got it. I never, I never did. So I would encourage her not to change the channel. I would also encourage her, do not plan on prevailing on an appeal. The problem is the lion's share of people who have money and who go to trial and lose, they continue to have the lawyers tell them exactly what they want to hear. Kids are still watching Paw Patrol. They have my on, on my phone. You're going to win. Don't worry. No problemo. No, nobody wins a trial. No juror, Elizabeth, can understand your intellect and what you did and the business you did and the money you made. Of course it's Belvoni. Of course the people you retained, it was their fault. You're managing a whole organization. A jury's not going to see that. They look at what you made. Did, do they know you were on Jim Cramer, Mad Money, and everywhere else? Weren't you on some panel with former presidents? Of No jury's going to convict you, but you will prevail on appeal. So what prisoners do who go to trial, they too often believe that. Therefore, they never really adjust in prison because they think at any time the phone's going to be ringing. Uh, your appeal has come through. And as a response, once they lose, a whole new like devastation sets in like, wow, I'm going to be here for a while. Continuing, I would encourage her to never discuss uh, politics. And I would also remind her, Elizabeth, do not give up hope. I would remind her that people have endured worse. My business partner served 26 years for a nonviolent drug crime, right? People in that prison have been and have endured so much without complaining. They have found perspective. They've grown their network and they've done their job. So I would remind her to maintain hope remain humble, be grateful for everything that remains, right? Too many prisoners focus on everything we've lost, including me. As I approach my 15 year anniversary of surrendering to federal prison on April 28th, I used to obsess about over what I lost. And then I got there and learning from these fine men, I used to think, I'm so grateful for what I have left. And if she can do that, this experience as we turn into things that she should do, can be a little blip in her life. Now, you may be thinking, Justin, 11 and a quarter years, that ain't no blip, man. Well, I don't know. Maybe she's going to do the drug program and get a year off. She's going to get the good time, which is like near a year and a half or two years, whatever it is. She's going to get a year in the halfway house. She's going to get a year off for the First Step Act. More prison reform might be coming. Some of you may be disgusted to know in 11 and a quarter years, she could be out of there six, seven years. That may frustrate you. And that's without more prison reform. The point is, it is a little blip in her life. And what she should be doing as we transition to dues, she should be preparing to document the journey. The best piece of advice I would give Elizabeth Holmes or any one of our clients traversing this wretched system is write for five minutes a day. I began writing five minutes a day in a daily blog. And that blog became a harbinger for a book called Lessons from prison I wrote with Michael on the inside. But you can't run a mile without running a block. You can't write a book without writing a page. Five minutes a day will transform and change her life. And I continue to have some of those writings behind me on my wall. The problem is too many prisoners adjust in a way where they're like, hey, I'm just going to get settled in. I'm going to relax. I'll get around to preparing. And they've created habits that get them further away from their goals. So she needs to be documenting her journey five minutes a day and proving worthy of the love and support in her, of her family. Chapter 18 of Ethics in Motion, I wrote, if I'm ever a father, and I wasn't a father when I went to prison at 33, it's why it was so much easier for me. I wasn't married. I didn't have children. But I wrote in that chapter, if I have children, can they ever admire me? Would they ever look up to me? Would they ever view me as a man of integrity? because I went to federal prison. And I knew the way that I could build it wasn't through happy talk, cliches, or platitudes, but by working, but by demonstrating why I'm changing the narrative and why I'm worthy of a second chance, putting my victims first and repaying them. Elizabeth Holmes needs to do that because she will be paying restitution in prison. So I would encourage her five, 10 minutes a day to prove worthy of the love and support of her family because someday her young children will endure the pain and shame of knowing their mom went to prison as my young children will someday well, they're learning now because they see the media and the YouTube and they hear me talking about prison all day. But rather than talk about the embarrassment and shame, I talk about what I learned. And if I could do that, why can't Elizabeth Holmes do it? I mean, I went to USC. She went to Stanford. She didn't graduate, by the way. Another thing she should do is really have her network manage her her whole com her, her, her visitation list when she's going to, you know, how frequently she's going to call, how pe frequently people are going to visit. I would really under encourage her to have a primary point of contact who can manage that, including the media. Now, there's a chance eventually media could get in to film her. Uh, it could take some time. The warden has to approve it. She's going to need a lawyer. It's, there's a whole process behind it. But in order for that to happen, she's got to adjust well, avoid problems, but she needs to have a primary point of contact. She will have separate legal visits where she can have phone calls that, are, that will not be recorded, emails 
um, are not private with, with the lawyers, but she will have special visitation with lawyers and phone calls that are not recorded. What she should do, and this comes back to the prison hustle, is understand the financial implications. She owes a lot of restitution. She's going to surrender with money, probably four or five hundred four or five hundred bucks she'll send in through Western Union. And you can expect the prison to take restitution. It's called Financial Responsibility Program. Right now, it's still voluntary. Soon, it's going to be mandatory. But there are some prisoners who say, I don't have to pay, or my judge said, I don't have to pay until I come home. The problem with that is it could it doesn't align with what the prison wants to see, which is somehow, some way, you making your victims whole, whether you think you're guilty or not. I use the analogy when I was a baseball player at USC, there was voluntary baseball practice. But let me tell you what I learned. If you chose not to go to the voluntary practice, a uh, coach Gillespie chose to not play you in the game. So in other words, it's, it's mandatory. And I would encourage her to understand financial restitution, not pay it. Some prisoners try to get around it, and you'll see a, a visiting in a Outside of a visit in the parking lot, you'll see wives and girlfriends like giving money to one another. They're pay, PayPal and Venmoing money to one another. Because what will happen is you only have $360 a month to spend in the commissary. But money that comes in, the prison may take $50, $100, or $200 a month of that. So they'll say, I don't want money on my books. I'm going to have money go to four other people's books so I can bump up my spending. And therefore, I'll pay them a little fee, 50 or 25 or 50 bucks to shop for me. I can increase my budget and the prison's not going to take more for restitution. Eventually, people get caught, especially when you have a sentence that's more than 11 years in federal prison. What I would encourage Elizabeth Holmes to do is to create a very deliberate reading list, right? There are people in federal prison who read, but if I were to ask them, what did you read? Why did you read it? What did you learn from it? And how will the book help you? They'll be like, um, I don't really know the answer to that question. So Elizabeth Holmes should create a very deliberate reading list and be able to articulate why she's reading it and how it will help her. Because someday, and I know this sounds corny to, to some of you, writing these book reports, some people kind of make fun of me for it. Like, I'm going to share them with my children. I read 100 books and more than 100 books in federal prison, and I wrote book reports about them, and I'm going to share them with my kids someday and say, some kids, your dad was in federal prison at 34 for dumb decisions that I made, and I deserve to go to prison. I deserve to be held accountable. But I wanted you to know on Tuesday, June 8th, 2008, Rather than complain and blame everyone else for my plight in life, I was choosing to read and understand how I ended up here, the motivations behind my choices, and this book helped me do that. Here's a book report I wrote. Maybe you have interest in it. So if she can engage in a really deliberate reading list, she can discuss it with her fiancé over the phone um, when, when they visit. One thing she should do as she prepares to surrender is prepare her personal belongings. She should surrender with her contact list. Our team is very big into release plans that will soon be ubiquitous in the Federal Bureau of, of Prisons. Uh, Jennifer Shaw, who's a client of ours, also at Bryan Federal Prison Camp, I did a video, video with her where she talked about her release plan. So Elizabeth Holmes gets ready to go to federal prison. She should have created her, her release plan. Release plan, any medications, usually you're unable to get in um, with money. I try to get in with a pair of running shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and a watch, and they said, uh, that's not going to happen. The reason they let you bring in very few things, they say it threatens security of the institution, but the real reason is because they want you to buy it in the prison commissary. Prison industrial complex is a big deal. They want to make money. She will be able to go in with her uh, with her legal paper, papers. She'll write legal mail on the outside. One more thing she should do, and again, I could speak for, for days, weeks, and months about things she should and do not do, but I wanted to knock out this uh, video to cover some some basics. She should like always consider the quadrant theory that we discussed. There's high risk, low reward, high risk, and vice versa. So like every decision I began to make in prison, I used to assess, is this high risk and low reward and vice versa? For example, writing a blog and book, which I did, was very high risk and very high reward. High reward because it helped me build a brand and a business and help thousands of people over time. It was also higher risk because staff was reading the blog and they were commenting on the blog. Now with iPhones and all of these prisons, they're going to people pe would be people Googling Elizabeth Holmes blog. Why is she in prison? All of the, all of these things. So if she writes a blog or she documents her journey, she's got to do so in a way that she knows that everyone is absolutely going to read it. So I would encourage your low risk, low reward. Watching TV all day, low risk, low reward. Some people would argue it's actually uh, high risk, low reward, because a lot of the fights and problems tend to break out in the TV room. This is our final video on Elizabeth Holmes. I'm a little emotional. I'm going to wrap it up here by closing with something that I think is off-putting to, to some of you, despite the really nice messages I, I get and the favorable comments about my journey and the value I strive to provide, it upsets some of you. 
that I don't think she should be going to prison for more than 11 years. And I've said this about many of our clients, Todd and Julie Chrisley, who are in federal prison for 12 and, and seven years for going to trial, Jennifer Shaw for 78 months, and hundreds of our other clients who, in some cases, made bad decisions and who ended up going to, to federal prison. I have never said there shouldn't be consequences for breaking the law, ever. Watch any of the myriad videos I've done, the media from Dr. Phil to Fox to CNN and elsewhere, and I've never justified or said there should not be consequences. There should have been consequences for me, and I went to, to federal prison. The question is, at what expense? I think we speak too frequently about the victims as a throwaway or as a buzzword to feel good. But I can tell you, because we have been so prolific in this space for so long, we get calls from victims. I filmed that video a couple of weeks ago that I received a call from a victim of, from Jennifer Shaw who said, I am apoplectic about the opportunities that she has in federal prison, that she can play pickleball, bocce ball, she's going to do a play, she can read, she can write. This is ridiculous. As a victim, I want her to suffer. And I reminded her and all of you, Jennifer Shaw, Elizabeth Holmes, the Chrisleys did not create the system of corrections in this country. She didn't build it. She's enduring the system that was created. Now, a lot of people do like to know there will be suffering. There is pain of separation from your, your friends and family. And it can be in dehumanizing to work in that kitchen or to walk into some of those shower stalls and to see some of the things that she's going to see. And I know that makes some of you feel good because I've seen the comments. It doesn't change in an enlightened society. If we truly care about the victims, I think there should be a sanction. I'm not saying it shouldn't be prison, but how long and at what expense? If someone can earn their way home, in other words, you get 10 years, but you demonstrate after two, three or four years why you're worthy of release, get back to work and the lion's share of that income goes to victims, I'm all for it. I said this before the Chrisleys hired our team. I think 12 and seven years for that family is ridiculous, a great taxpayer expense. I don't believe it. Not, I don't agree with it. Not in an enlightened society. But I know some of you don't care where your tax dollars go. And I know many of you have said, I wish they would bury her underneath that prison. And in fact, I wish they would send her far, farther away from Bryan, Texas, as far away as she can because she's wicked and she's evil and she's terrible. I see it differently. I believe as human beings, we make bad choices and we can overcome them with the right plan and the right attitude. But day by day growth, that's the last thing I'll say. Use the analogy of a marathon. A lot of people focus on the beginning, they celebrate the end. The work in between is how I overcame my, my white collar crime conviction. The work I did every day, getting up early and running and writing and thinking and growing and growing my network and demonstrating to my friends and family why I was worthy of a second chance. If she can do it, I count on her to succeed, even if that leads to dislikes on this video, because I want to be honest, I want to be authentic, and I always strive to be transparent. We incarcerate too many people in this country, a great, too great a taxpayer expense. The sentences should be shorter with the priority on the victims. And um, that's how I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you very much for joining me on this Elizabeth Holmes uh, journey. Thank you for joining the White Collar Advice channel. I hope you found value in this video. Thank you. Bye-bye.